This episode of the Better Two podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of the Better Two Burnout series, which includes her latest releases of Fairy Tales and I Love You and His Love Just Another High. Get ready to root for Jen Poff, a struggling actress whose career is about as lively as a wilted flower. Her soulmate, Wes Blankenship, is a music maestro with a heart of gold. Along comes Mason Langford, a Hollywood big shot with a cutting proposal to help Jen get back on the map. But hold the phone, folks. Mason has a ginormous ego and cares more about his agenda than helping Jen. What's his hidden agenda? Jen soon realizes the sinister catch, but it's too late, and Mason springs an ultimatum on her. Can she bear to be apart from West for five long years? Get ready to be whisked away on a wild emotional ride with this gripping story. Love is Worth Waiting For is a second chance rock star romance with a fake relationship set in Hollywood and comes with a happy ending. Love is Worth Waiting For is available now at most online booksellers. Hi, gang. Welcome to the Better Two podcast. I'm your host, Donna. Today's guest is Danny Saber. Danny has a project that he's working on that is helping someone from the past, Michael Hutchins, return with a new set of songs. Well, at least a couple for now, but there's more to come, hopefully. Anyway, our conversation talks about Michael, other bands that he's worked with, and so much more. So tune in. All right, here we go. Hi, Danny. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. So you, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit before we get into the main topic of what you're releasing with Michael Hutchins. But let's go back to you as an artist. I mean, you just are not a music producer. A lot of people know you as a music producer, but you've also been a musician. And I guess my focus, I want to focus a little bit on when did you realize that, hey, I want to do this for a living, that this isn't just a hobby. I want to learn how to do everything that I ended up doing. Well, you know, it all started with just playing the guitar. Look, I appreciate the question because that, funny enough, is all this stuff that you see. And back in the day, it was all just a vehicle so I could play the guitar. So, but I also kind of learned early. I mean, you know, like all kids, you go through phases and, you know, it started with Jimi Hendrix and I got, you know, kind of into like Steely Dan and I wanted to be a studio musician. And I just realized, you know, and it's funny how you measure yourself against guys in your school. And I mean, I wasn't even, you know, in the conversation as, the, you know, who's going to make it? There was a guy, what am I? But like all the people that were sort of above me, so to speak, always let me like hang out. And it's funny because the one guy who I was in, we had a jazz band class and one of the the other guitarists who I'm still in touch with to this day, there was like 30 guitar players, 10 drummers, two bass players, and like one piano player in that class. But one of the guitar players was um, was Craig Ross, Lenny's guitar player. So we went to high school together and we were in jazz band and Craig was just another guitar player in the jazz band class. Wow. But he wasn't just another guitar player in the jazz band class. He was like, you knew you could tell he was... Who he ended up becoming, it's funny, was like, you know, he was more like, you know, he's probably good student, a little more, at least from the outside looking in, he, you know, he's more like, I guess straight is the right way to say it. But he turned out to be like a full on balls out rock star. And on top of that, an amazing guitar player. But he was a great musician in high school. Like he was probably every you could just you just knew that guy. This guy's going somewhere with it, you know, and uh, there was a couple other guys. This guy, Paul Peterson, who was sort of. The, the you know the, the he I mean he looked the part in high school he was and he was like we ended up in a band together eventually so you know I always knew I, I just knew it was not even a thing of like pretty much within a year of starting to play I just knew what I wanted to do but I also figured out pretty early on that I kind of had a knack for putting stuff together as opposed to like I'm going to survive just like on playing my guitar, yeah. and then I got my hands on a drum machine and a, and a keyboard and a little Florida studio pretty early on, like a couple of years in, and uh, I started making little songs. And then I kind of always imagined, oh, it'd be so cool to make music for films or TV or something like that. But in those days, there was no way to even begin to know how to get into anything. It was like everything was cryptic. Knowing how to get distortion out of your guitar was like some mythological journey because there was no information 
other than, you know, a couple of magazines and what your friends had. Yeah. So, you know, but yeah, that that's the thing. I, I, I was always sort of once I knew I knew I was probably, you know, 14 or something. I started playing at 13. So. A year and a half in, I knew what I wanted to do. Like I, there was no question about it. It was just like the phases you go through and the evolution of it, and then starting to see it clear. Of, oh, here's here's a way to go. You know, but I never could have imagined. No, I remember. And you're going to see the Rolling Stones. You could never even like dare to. You know, someday. I, I mean, you, it's so beyond stupid that it's like. I get it. I mean, I'll be jamming I, with them one day. I, I get it. I mean, I remember. Okay, yeah. So I was a ba- I wanted to be a bass player. I I took lessons when I was eighteen, and I wanted to be a bass player, most likely for the wrong reasons. And I remember when my stepdaughter. I was already divorced from her dad, but she was acting out, and my ex husband's like, "You need to come talk to her." I'm like, "Okay, fine." She's like, "Dad bought me a bass," and I'm like, "Okay." Oh. I, I'm like, "Did you?" Did you did you know I played? She goes, no, I didn't. Even though it was around, she never knew. I said, so why do you want to be a bass player? Because I want fame and fortune. <laughs> I, I just looked at her and said, do it for the music. If you don't do it, if you you don't love playing, then you're never gonna make it because there's a lot of ups and downs in this business, and you're never gonna make it unless you really love it. And that yeah. sounds. I'm not dissuading no, anybody from picking it I up. Mean, yeah, you know, it's, but but I, let's be honest. Like when you're 15 year old boy, all you really want to do is, you know, girls meet girls and 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 be cool. Mm-hmm. You know, but then somewhere along the lines, you start to. But there was more to it. It was always like there was almost like a um, pretty much from day one actually because it was it took like I saw a poster of Jimi Hendrix when I was 11, and it always seems to be dad. It's like I worked my dad for two years. It took me two years of just. Because I had a friend down the street who had a guitar. So I used to go sit in his room and play his guitar, you know, more than he played it and uh, drove him nuts. Then I, you know, worked my old man for a couple of years and I finally got the guitar. My mom was kind of like, they were both right. You know, my dad was cool with it. His only thing was if I buy you a guitar, you know, you're going to play it for a week and it's going to end up under the bed. You know, and I'm like, no, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. And then my mom was sort of like, knew instinctively what comes along with that guitar. <laughs> <laughs> right but yeah. Uh, yeah but then at some point you you know you start to kind of figure it out there's definitely a um um spiritual component you know and and i think that's part of what's and it's no it's not anyone's fault it's just the world we live in now like there's a whole you know the, the, that whole thing of being compelled to do it you got to be compelled to do it if, to start if you're really going to do something with it and you you know, but you don't, right. you know, there's like a kind of the talent show paradigm has sort of changed what's held up as success. You right. Know? And uh, it is what it is, you know, where like, you know, where you're, you know, you were striving to be Jimi Hendrix or a producer, and, you know, the Quincy Jones and George Martin and like who sits in that role now? I don't know. You know, there isn't really, the world just doesn't work that way. There were certain things you couldn't escape. You couldn't escape Prince and Madonna and Michael right. Jackson. But biggest has never always meant just because something's the biggest doesn't mean it's the best. But it kind of used to do used to mean that. Like the Beatles were the biggest. Yeah. You make the argument they were the best. <laughs> Michael Jackson was the biggest. Yeah, I mean that was the thing. It he was definitely like... was. I consider. I think he's the greatest art, individual artist of all time. You know, so the success was was more than just. It was built on something really deep and 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 like with Michael Jackson. I mean, from the time the guy was five years old, right? It was right. like look at by the when he by the time he was 17, he was he could look at Paul McCartney and they were on the same level. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You you had to have talent back then. It wasn't something that could be faked. I mean, sure, you can process certain things and, and clean cer- certain things up, but now you can really clean things up. And the person that doesn't have the greatest voice, you can suddenly make them have a wonderful singing voice. You can make it, yeah, and then and it's then put it on, and then put it on the internet, and get all yeah, the likes. The other problem, there's there's no filters anymore, you know. But I I think the one thing that's really the area that suffered, like all that is true, but it's that, and you know, we went to go try to see the Rolling Stones the other night at SoFi. And I'd never, I haven't been to a big, huge show like that in a while. 
And I mean, you get to the arena and the first thing, there's a loop on a PA speaker telling you all the things you're not allowed to do before you haven't even gotten the building yet. Welcome to SoFi. We are a non-smoking, non-vaping uh, uh, environment. You can't do this. You can't bring in bags. You can't do that. It's like, why are you telling me all this shit? It was on there. You know, I'm going to a rock show. Like, I want to go and forget about the rules for a couple of hours, you know? And it's just, that's the world we live in now. Everything is so over, especially in California, everything's so over-regulated and rules. And it's all about squeezing the gray area out of life and getting us... All the answers are inside our own heads. And from the time we're little kids, everything is geared to get us away from being able to be in tune with that voice. And if you're an artist worth anything, and I think that's the difference. I it, teach. It's more effective now. It's really hard to stay in touch if you're if you're under a certain age, you know, like because like I was lucky enough to be old enough that that the things that are really and it's always been that way, but it's just way more. It does, it's not like they are trying to do it. It's just a result of the, the technology and the world we live in. And, and the it's a lot of things, but that's ultimately what it boils down to. You know, we're not being driven by that voice inside because everything's here to not get us not to listen to it. You know, well, I teach an intuition class. And one of the things I talk about is the fact that from when we're little, we are we are very in tune. We will pick up on things. We'll pick up on other entities. We will we know that we know things that are going to happen. I mean, my parents weren't fighting. And at eight years old, I'm like, you can go to Disney World by yourself. And they're like, why? Because you guys need some time alone. They weren't fighting in front of me. I had no idea they'd be divorced a year later. But my point is, I understood that. What I teach about though is the fact that between the political, the media, the religious aspect, our parents, our grandparents, there's certain things that they want us to present. We're supposed to present in a certain role in the world. Therefore, yeah. we have to tune off this stuff because somebody might think you're nuts. Well, yeah, well, it's indoctrination. is really yeah. And there's a system. But there used to be, I mean, I think where it's, it's crumbling because there kind of was a little bit of a truth. And if you do X, Y, and Z, and you, you know, you follow the rules, you got a pretty good shot at having a decent life. And it, you know, and someone like myself who was like, you know, went against the grain just because I don't know why I just was that way. Um, that never really applied to me. I never bought into that. So, but I think what's happened is the world now, it's, 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 and especially COVID. I mean, COVID, that lockdown, a lot of people got to, you know, that was something you used to have to be able to earn being able to just, survive on your own and it takes a lot of discipline to just get up every day and do your own thing it really does and a lot of people got a taste of that freedom and they don't want to go back to that structured right you know thing and then on top of it it's just man it's just people aren't buying it anymore you know mm -hmm. but then at the same time it's getting more and more like to the point where what's in front of your face, there's no collective consciousness anymore. There's no baseline truth everybody could agree on. Right. You know, but, just in the recent events, there's people that really think like, oh, God, it was, I don't care who you are supporting or what. It's That's not a good thing when somebody at the, of that level that represents that many people gets taken out. Yeah. I mean, think, you know, and I don't care what, it's not about what side you're on. And, and, and I hope people are starting to see that now. And art's supposed to remind us of that. And if art is so, if all the soul and all the essence of what really, you know, the teeth is taken out of it, especially with music, it makes it that much easier for people to buy into the bullshit, you know? And that's where Michael comes in because hopefully, you know, it's even though it's of another time, it's it's been done now, it's modern. It's like, it's of this time. So it's a way to bridge those two worlds, hopefully, and remind people that, hey, this is what the real greatness looks like, you know? Mm -hmm. That's one I mean, of my hopes. And it seems to be hitting people that way, just based, you know, the response since it's come out. It's been like, oh, thank you. you know, there's been, and also there's been no negativity and the focus is, is shifted back to, you know, how great he was and how great his band was, because they were great too. Without that whole, without in excess, nothing I'm doing would mean anything. So like, you know, that's the foundation it's built on. But Michael was an individual in his own right. He needed to express himself outside the confines of that. But at the same time, you know, he was never going anywhere. It was not an either or situation. It was he's that kind of it, it all gets back to where we started. He was compelled 
mm-hmm. to, to get it out. You know, and I mean, a lot of times when you're in a band, it's like a marriage. You, you, these are your mates, and either you're gonna go weather yeah, the storm, right. or you're gonna end up breaking up. Yeah, he um, was never- I don't buy that. A couple of people have said that he wasn't going anywhere. They would have been like, oh. if they were under and they would have ended up circling back, had this fantastic renaissance. They'd be in the rock and roll hall of fame. All that shit would be done. And, you know, hopefully with a little luck, we, you know, we had some plans for what we were doing and, you know, it might've caught on. It might not have, but it would have given him that Avenue to just get back to what drove him to do it in the first place without all the pressure and the, I, I agree with you about him not leaving because here's the thing. I, I remember when Max Q came out and a lot of people were mortified when Max Q came out that NXS is breaking up and he was doing some films. And it's like, no, let him have his side piece. He needs that side and that, action. And there, that was everything was done to undermine that and make sure it didn't succeed for that precise reason. <laughs> which is unfortunate because it's a really yeah. good record. And I have some of the 12 inch singles still, yeah, which, people, you know. <laughs> Like okay. the record I did with him, it was, you know, and we didn't really like, you know, like, especially the, the songs I wrote with him, you know, we, if he had lived, we would have refined them. The essence of what was there was there, but, you know, you never had that chance to kind of come back and just dial it in. And, but it still did, it still stands up because that's how great he was. There's no, it was always on. So even if we were in a writing session, the vocals, once he had it, he had it. It was like, I always say it's more like sculpting, doing vocals with the Michaels and the mix and the Bonos of the world. Then so it's not like they go in and do 20 takes and then it's like, no, no, it's always there. And they just keep chipping away at it. And eventually it arcs to where it wants to be. But. Well, that's the thing. He was an artist. I mean, he was, he was very talented. And unfortunately what happened is everybody started focusing on how he passed instead of listening to the music. When that CD came out, the solo CD, I was thrilled to have it. I was thrilled and it moved me because the music was there were some songs in there like possibilities that were just so emotionally touching. Thanks. Yeah, that's I think that like if I I mean for me personally, I think that's probably the best song. So it's the piece of music and everything about it, uh, you know. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done. So I appreciate that, you know. But I think the other thing to not lose sight of too is all the because Michael was really special and unique in this sense. He was a really super hypersensitive sort of a person. Like he was in tune with all his senses. And, and then he had this ability to take it all in and then spit it back out with something that resonated with millions and millions of people. But that all came from empathy and just, you know, I mean, a genuinely really was a kind of high spirited dude. He would do anything he could to help his friends. He was there was no kind of bitchiness in him. Or, or, you know, he was, he had an ego and he was, you know, he had fun with stuff, but he was, there was, I never saw him misuse his power. You know what I'm saying? Like he was in a very powerful position to yeah. take advantage of people in a million different ways. And he never would do that, you know, like he just wasn't wired that way. But that's also what contributes to the vulnerability that kind of put him in the position he was in to, for what happened to happen, you know, and that's what people don't really, they never, everyone wants to know what happened, what happened, what happened. Well, how about why did it happen? How could it happen? Like, you know, I mean, it's a bit like the goose that laid the golden egg, you know? That's the thing with, I did watch, I rewatched last night, the last rock star, the last real rock star. Oh, cool. Um, I had seen it back in 2020 and it was kind of weird because I'm looking at it going, yeah, well, you've interviewed Chris now and now you're interviewing Danny tomorrow. So that was kind of surreal for a moment. But I did realize that you also had some other music on there that you had. There's like three other songs that played in there. Are you are you intending to ever release those three songs? Yeah, I mean, there's 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 about seven altogether. And, and, and there's a couple I think there's at least one or two nobody's heard like they weren't in there. There's a song that was sort of briefly featured called Madness that's really been written to be a duet. But the whole the whole plan with that movie was, you know, we spent 10 years trying to get a documentary made because we knew that we had this little batch of songs and, you know, there was no point in putting another record out. You saw what happened with the first one, like there was no one to promote it. So we needed something to a vehicle to kind of promote the music and um. You know, a lot of time had gone by. And by the time The Last Rockstar got made, it was even more time because I discovered the music was discovered, let's call it, in 2008, somewhere in there. I mean, 2007, somewhere in there, six, seven, eight, somewhere in that vicinity. 
And then it was like pretty immediate. All right, let's try to get a movie made. That took another 10 years. And then, you know, so I was careful because the plan was to recut the film and release it internationally and release the music with the film. Because it only aired in Australia to right. New Zealand. And for a hundred thousand reasons, it, it just didn't work out. So finally got to the, you know, the end of last year, beginning of this year. And it was like, all the fans knew, you knew, you right. You had seen it. Yeah. So it was like, all right, well, let's throw. And then I kind of found myself in a position where I could put something out. So I just said, let's put it out. Let's put out a single and see what happens. And, uh, but I didn't want to just give it away. Right. You know, if I had put this stuff on Spotify and iTunes, it would have been gone. It would have been over in 48 hours. No right. matter what I did. So it's too valuable, you know, and if we as artists don't value our own stuff, how how do we expect anybody else to? So it's worked out really great because you know, like, we did a pre-sale and four months in and we're really just starting to tell the story now, you know, and it's great and it's an ongoing thing. And then there's other things kind of, you know, falling into place and, and there's something and there's some energy guiding this whole thing up above somewhere because... Just to be in here now talking to you, think about, uh, you know, I think about this sometimes, all the things that had to not happen, that weren't allowed to happen, you know, like, you know, there was so, so many moments in the, when there was this thing on the table, oh, and, 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 and I, you know, was so hoping it was going to happen and it just didn't work out, right? Because mm-hmm. it, it wasn't allowed to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's really interesting, you know, so that's my been my thing. I'm just... You know, got to like probably a while ago. It's like, you know what? It's not about trying to force the issue. It's just allow. It's like creating music or anything creative. You got to, it's a bad, it's, it's Bruce Lee, it's B Water, it's Ying and the Yang. It's, you got to harness the energy and allow things to happen. But then at the same, like they say, let the game come to you. But you still have to be proactive and take initiative. You can't just sit back. It's a really interesting thing when you look at it. And I think, well, I mean, Story will probably hopefully if we get a movie made, it'll be, that'll be part of the story is telling the story of the story because it's just really, really interesting how things can just unfold, you know. Well, they did Johnny Depp, uh, they did that with uh, when Johnny Depp was playing Don Quixote. The movie never got made, the movie stalled, but they ended up making a documentary about the movie being made. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I want to check that out. It was, it's quite a while ago now, but like, I mean, when I sit here and think if I would not have seen you post about the press release, when you post about the press release, I was like, well, maybe I should, I'll wait to do this. And I was like, no, I heard it. I heard the inner voice saying, no, do this. So I reached out and that was last Monday and here we are. So sometimes you have to take that initiative, even though it may not work out, you still have to be willing to do it. So let me ask you this. So I I believe it is 2006. These tapes are unearthed. What is your, you know, what do you do? You get this phone call that's saying, hey, I got this. What do you want to do with this? Yeah, something like that. And then it was like, well, the first thing you had to do is listen to it. See, okay, (laughs) there's all these ideas, but let's see what's there. You know, is there anything? But it it, it was, you know, because remember now, they were all on two-inch tape. It wasn't like there was a bunch of like, you know, Michael sitting with an acoustic guitar. Here's the song, and it's, it was very pieces. It was yeah, and and there was thirty thing, thirty around thirty of these ideas. You know, well, actually, no, because some a couple of them came from me and him. There was some stuff. In fact, uh, not that long ago, it wasn't lost, but I forgot we did it. I found one thing, and I think it might be the one. I mean, they're all great. The ones, the ones that people will actually hear are all very strong, because you know I'm not going to do anything. That would be the only real room for criticism at this point. Is, to try to put some shit out, garbage, you know, for the sake of it. So there's a pretty, there's a, you know, there's a standard Michael set on his own and with his band that has to be met. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was basically it. Just start going through the stuff and figure out if any of it's even worthy of being heard. And that didn't take very long. We figured it out. Okay, yeah, there's some stuff here. And then it became, okay, cool. But then what are we going to do with it? And then the process of going through it and produce, like you need a but you need it takes time, it takes money. It's like, you know, great, I got all this stuff. And this is back. Well, yeah, I had a little, I've always sort of had my own studio, so to speak. But uh, you know, it's still the time and 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 you know, so it's that's gotten that's been the interesting thing about this creatively is how much technology has changed 
and things I could do six months ago that I couldn't do six years ago, right? Right. And having that opportunity to kind of go back and keep chipping away and sculpting, you know, without trying to not to screw the stuff up and do too much to it. So, yeah. And then it's just like I said, it was about figuring out, all right, well, what are we going to do with it? And, and you know, it took a long time for all that stuff to shake out. Well, sometimes, though, the best pieces of music or best things take time. I mean, a wine does not taste good when it's first made, does it? I don't know. Exactly. I don't really drink wine, but from what I understand, yeah, wine is better for in the jerk. Bring us some fresh wine. Let's yeah. This old shit. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you have to, art is like that. Sometimes art is more appreciated after it's been around for a longer time. Well, that's true. And I think also too, like, there's a certain amount of leeway. I think people a, are going to want to like it. You know, people aren't going to come in at least, or at least most people, the fans. And, and, like, again, the song is, I think it's important, with, especially with anything Michael would have done. It's always, there's an honesty to it, right? Like, even, it's like, I love my favorite line in Scarface, I always tell a truth, even when I lie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And there's, there's always a truth to everything. And I've tried to maintain that with everything I do, where it's just like, you know, which basically means trying to you're not chasing somebody else's you know trying to please the outside world like right. try to make something you think people will like you've just got to go with that gets back to that inside the head thing um and and, and that sincerity in the in the journey sort the process and so that's the main thing to maintain and just keeping the standard up and the one thing that 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 we kind of talked about a lot um which was a big like kind of front and center um, at the time because of the circumstances, hold on a second, I got to, um, was just, you know, to, to give him the space to, to, to express whatever he wanted to express outside the confines of like the big, big you know, at one point, Inexcess probably was the biggest man in the world for a while. And that comes with a lot of like, it becomes almost like a weight, you know? Right. You know, and it's it's inevitable. You know, it's that balancing, trying to maintain what you have and keep moving forward. So this the situation and environment I tried to help provide for him was anything goes. There's nothing's off the table. Let's just go where the music takes us. And if if you're hearing something in your head, it's like it, it might be a guitar part. It might be whatever. You know, and it's none of this, or I'm the guitar player, you're the singer, shell, you know, and none right. of that, which is normal in all band dynamics, you know, and just giving him that freedom and 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 it was like kind of liberating for him. I mean, he told me he talked about this stuff. So it's I've got a pretty solid sense of like what would fly. I mean, you could never be replaced, but at least you can keep that mentality the same, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you're talking about Success. And I mean, success, a lot of the times we put people on pedestals, especially nowadays, only to watch them fail, only to knock them off. Britney Spears, I always say, is a prime example of that. We built Britney Spears up so high to watch her be knocked off. And when I go back to watching that last night, you know, Michael was at at one point. Yes, he was the rock star. You know, uh, Terry Nunn had wrote a song about him that is no longer available. She released it on one CD. It's not really listed anywhere called Sacred and Profane. And it's a great song, but they named a record Sacred and Profane, but she the song is not on there. But my whole point is he was he inspired other people. And so watching that and yes, it brought up the uh, moment of Oasis at the award show and you saw him the next day. And when you think about how this, this person sits there and says this to him. And then when you look at where Oasis is now. Well, right. Well, the, 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 the fucked up thing about it was we were, will not know so much, but if you look closely, Liam kid, they gives him a kiss. Mm-hmm. We were all hanging out together. It was mm-hmm. like, because don't forget, it's like black rape was dominated. So I, we're at, we had a table. Michael's there working as a presenter. I'm making a record with him at that time. Liam's like, you know, bouncing around, sitting with us because, you know, Sean and Liam. Mm-hmm. You know, Liam held Sean in reverence because he was like the dawn of Manchester. So we're all hanging out and suddenly it gets up front and it's like, 
the fuck is that about, man? Like, you know, uh, we were just breaking bread. Now, now we're in front of the people and you're going to take a dig. And I think with Noel, just I'm sure he wouldn't, if he had it a hundred times, I've met Noel a few times. I think, you know, he, I mean, he's, he, he's a brilliant, amazing person. And I think it's just, you know, that's also being young and, you know, mm-hmm. they were just sort of hitting their stride at that point. So it just was some unnecessary shit that oh. didn't need to be said, you know, but it did, but it, it hit, but it was kind of also, and that's where that tabloid, Worst fear, nightmare shit in Michael's head comes into play. It all now all of a sudden it's fucking real from your peers. It's one yeah. thing for the press to do that. They're supposed to do that. That's what they do. But uh, anyways, it is what it is. But I think I think that's what a lot of people don't recognize about musicians is, and even any kind of creative person is that as much as we don't, we, we try not to believe our own reviews. We try to stay focused on what we're doing and true to ourselves. There's still the nagging thing of somebody not being happy or giving us a nasty review or saying something incendiary, incendiary in the press that makes you feel like shit. And how do you get past that? Especially when you have not just that you have everything else going on in your life. And that's, there's a lot of pressure on you to, remain focused and creative. Right. And it's, I think it's more a thing, a case of two, like it depends on the individual. But one thing Bono told me once was the one thing all singers have in common is like a desperate need to be loved. Mm-hmm. Like, cause it's like, what else would get you to go out? I mean, what singers do is like true front men that get up. I mean, other than maybe comedians, there's nobody more exposed. Right. Right. And then it like, you know, depending on the personality of, of the person, you know, they could hit it like I don't give a fuck what anybody does. But we all want to we nobody does this to you know, that's the biggest line is when, oh, you know, I don't care if I'm come on, nobody sits and goes through all this trouble to make music to not want people to hear it and people to like it. You know. The difference is again, that's that whole thing of 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 um um, the right word would be uh, like integrity, I guess. Like, are you? Do- it's like the cart before the horse. Are you doing it to try to please people, or are you doing it and hoping it pleases people? Right, like and staying true to whatever's driving you. So it's that balancing that thing, you know. And it's fine when you. But sort of gotten out of whack, I think. In the, in the thing now, now it's about a, a pre-existing hole to fill, as opposed to oh, look at this, look at this woman, Janice Joplin. She's so talented. Let's build it. We'll figure it out a marketer. Let's just, there's a talent here. We need to build something around right. this. So the world will get it. Not, okay, here's the hole. Let's drop in the person to fill the hole. And then the music, the music, it's weird, man. I, I'll tell you too, you know, as a producer, I've noticed a really, really crappy shift in the mentality of artists. I don't know any other way to say it. Where look, it's great. We all want to make money, and 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 there's nothing wrong with being a businessman, and you're a businesswoman or business person, and you know, building your brand and all that type of stuff. But it's gotten to the point now where like the stuff that I've done tracks with three or four artists that are just hands down, like it's immediate. And I've seen the artist shit can them because either A, they don't get it. They're afraid how it's going to like whatever. The artist has become like the A&R person a little bit, like the mentality. It's not all artists, but that never would have happened. It was always we were fighting the label like we were, you yeah. never had to convince the artist when you knew you knew. And now it's like that is missing a lot of the times, you know, and that's, I think, part of the fallout of that whole. The paradigm shift in, in, in just. What's even, what are you really even chasing? Why am I even doing this? Like, it's just changed. That's the hard, that's the hard thing is you, you have to sit there and wonder, what am I doing if the younger generations don't understand the art of it? You know, it's like the death of a, the death of an album. A lot of people don't want to listen to an album straight through. They want to hit it on shuffle. And if it's on shuffle, then you're losing the, what the artist had envisioned. I watched this really great documentary about disco. And when you really understand the history of disco, I thought I knew the history and I knew the basics. You know, I knew where it came from. I knew what it represented. I knew, I knew quite a bit, but I never really realized 
how bastardized it became. I did, but I did. I mean, I got Rick D's disco duck sitting back there. <laughs> but it started out as such a, again, like every movement, whether it's hip hop, rock and roll, whatever offshoot of the initial, let's call it the blues and jazz, our only, America's only contribution to the world, like as far as an original art form. It always, whatever movement started, it always started like with, with disco. It came out of the gay clubs and it really was really revolutionary because people just wanted to dance. And there were laws against people even being allowed to dance just because they were the same sex. And that was really what that was the soundtrack of. And it was such, and it took like, what, a year or two to go from this legitimate, amazing, powerful. Mm hmm music to just getting so bastardized because there was a buck to be made. And that's probably the closest thing we saw back then to what we see now, where there was this manufactured component to it. Yeah. You know. But anyways, that is what it was. I mean, well, I, good news, you know, there's, there's everything bad. It's like, I, I, the best result, the best advice I, I ever got was don't think in absolutes. Cause for example, I can point out if something fucked up now, I can also find a reason why it's great. You know, so, so there's, you know, it's just all how you look at it. Well, when I look at, you know, you're talking about disco and when we had this sudden resurgence of country, I'm like, hey, folks, 1980, early 1980, 81, we had Urban Cowboy, we had the whole push of country music. It was the big thing because my dad went from country yeah, music. Yeah, me too. My dad had the catch steps in the cowboy. Mm -hmm. My dad was a Jew and he used to joke around. He had this big Jewish star and he would do, I'm a sheriff. And he would. <laughs> That was right after disco, and the same guy gave it to us, didn't he, old mm -hmm. John? <laughs> and I, I mean, he went from country, but my dad cracked me up because we went from country music. And granted, he, this is the man who had the wall on a cassette player that I borrowed, the Walkman. But then he went to Oingo Boingo. And I'm like, you go from country to Oingo Boingo. Okay, Dad. All right. Didn't understand it, but my dad did like music. He was, in, he was listening to country. What was it? I bet he was listening. Like, you don't really. Willie and Waylon. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. It's like he wasn't listening to fucking Juice Newton. No. You know, it's like you know who really got me to understand and appreciate country was Al Jurgensen because I got to spend. I took Joe Strummer to see Ministry, and Joe didn't know who they were, and I'm like, you got to see that because Ministry is one of my favorite bands of all time, and I, especially live. So we go to see Ministry. And they're playing like the Palladium. I think it was the Dark Side of the Spoon tour, and. Uh, there's this guy on this, there's this figure on the side of the of the stage. And you can see he's sitting in a wheelchair and he's sort of got a blanket over him. And Joe's like, it's fucking Timothy Leary, right? So we go in the back, you know, it's like I got Joe Strummer with me. I don't need a backstage pad. We just go, but somehow right. the next thing I know, we're in a limo with Al and Joe and 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 and, and Timothy Leary. We're up at the Mondrian, and you know, Al's invites us into his room and I'll leave out some of the, the graphic details, but he's got his music going and it's Patsy Cline and Hank Williams. And he, he loves, that's all he would, was listening to was country, but it was great because I got exposed to it through in that environment. It gives you a whole different perspective. Oh, yeah. And just like anything, Waylon Jennings and, you know, Chris, that whole, that whole click of, 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 of the outlaws, right? Like that's the real deal. That's just as legit as any yeah. other, as any yeah. other, genre of music you know so again it's the same thing it started you know really going and, and i don't think people really realize how much influence not like what i not even it's more like mountain music mountain music and the blues is what made rock and roll you know it wasn't just blues you know the, the, the all the you know the irish the irish that came over and brought their music right that, that was that's the, and and country sort of a pure form of that. True country. But, uh, it, it's all connected. It's all from the same sort of tree. You know. Again, mm -hmm. it just gets down to is it like people will say is it good or is it bad? I love all music. I just but it's really is it sincere? Is it real or is it jive? That's really what you're there. The question they're actually asking. True, because I mean, a lot of times people just are putting singles out to put singles out now. Yeah, so it is in place. It is what it is. What are you going to do? The only thing I can do is like do what I'm doing, which is make the most out of whatever opportunities I have. To work on stuff, and I got a fantastic opportunity with this with Michael stuff. It's like a gift, you know. So 
But I have to say something besides Michael. I mean, I look at your resume and you have worked with a lot of different people remixing stuff. You know, when you get a call or when you've gotten those calls that, hey, we want you to do this, what does that feel like for you? Well, I mean, it's been a while now, but when and back in the, well, you know, and, and it all kind of came out of everything for me really grew out of the that black, you know, the black red record, mm-hmm. which I produced about, you know, I was in the band, I played, you know, so so I am a producer. But the cool thing about remixing, it was actually Guy Osiri, my first manager, that sort of opened that whole world up to me. He's like, you need to do remixes. And I'm like, okay, what do I got to do? He goes, just take the vocal and make a new make a new track. But this is in like the early 90s when just having an opportunity to get in a recording studio was like huge and to get paid for it and, and have a budget. And, and then the cool, the cool thing about doing remixes back then was, the re, you know, if you did a remix, it was for a single that was about to come out. So you would do it and it would be out soon. And it was sort of my little laboratory kind of graduate school opportunity to really go in and, and, and hone my skills. Um and the first one I did was Information Society. But the second remix I got to do was, was a Madonna remix. And I kind of took the, those kind of credits over to England. And that's what opened up the door, you know, for everything else that followed. But, um, you know, like, the, the you know, yeah, the, some of it was surreal. Like when I got the opportunity to do the Bowie remixes initially, I did two I did two versions of Little Wonder. And after Bowie heard him, I got a phone call. You know, David wants to meet you. Which, I mean, think about how many remixes that guy gets done. And I got to go meet him and hang out, and that led to more stuff. And I think that's the thing that, that I'm proud of the most is you look at my resume, all the people that really matter are usually on there a, a few times. It's not like, oh, we did one, and then I always kept working with them. The same with you, too. Um, and what opened up that, Butch, uh, Butch Vig opened up that door because they had asked Butch to do one. And we had the same manager at the time, and, you know, garbage was in full swing. So, he wanted, he suggested we do it together. And again, it was another opportunity like to go into the studio with somebody and sort of get your masters, you know, like in that case and Butch Vigisms. Like when I got to go in the studio with the Stones, it was like, you know, advanced study of rock yeah. and roll, you know, because it's more than just the music too. It's absorbing yeah. being in those camps and being around those people. and just seeing how they do things, you know? And, and one of the coolest things about working with Stones was, you know, on the way up, you meet people and it's like, all right, this is the way it's done, you know, like the way the big boys do it. And, and it's some guy who like probably maybe got a single deal and had a test pressing done and that's as far as he got. And he's going to, you know, tell you, show you. And then you, and they're always like, you know, telling you all kinds of negative stupid shit and why you're doing it wrong and da 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 and then you get in a room with the rolling stones and you realize hey man that's what i thought that's what i used to do and that's what i thought and, and you realize how many people coming up that are like you know not being positive and helpful have no clue what the fuck they're even talking about <laughs> that happens a lot you think that this person has all the information and they don't well that's what you come to realize i, I came to realize like you can apply it to our current situation i mean it doesn't matter. I will say it's if it's the Rolling Stones or some band in a bowling alley. They're basically fighting and and and, and it's the same shit in play, the same sort of mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. everybody's fighting over the same shit. There's just more at stake, right? Yeah. And then when it all said and done, I mean, yeah, there's some smart people out there, and there's definitely people with agendas, but for the most part, people are winging it, man. <laughs> so you make it you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and uh and they're and they're looking out for themselves and they're looking out for the best interests of the people around them and yeah within that you get some bad actors and some people that are really up to no good but i think for the most part even most powerful people are just you know trying to like do what's in their best interest you know, hopefully it's just not at the expense of a whole shitload of other people, you know? This is true. So you you, you talked about David Bowie, and I mean, you worked on, he would, one of your tracks is on the Saint soundtrack. You also did another song that you're not credited for on the Saint soundtrack, and that's Out of My Mind. 
I don't know if my version is on there though. That might be. Why. I don't think it's on the same soundtrack. But you know, when I was looking up stuff, it yeah, was they like released you... it as a single. That was a whole thing where the again, that's where the band sort of it was the. Well, I don't want to get into the details, but one of the band members just kind of fought tooth and nail to because the the plan was that that was going to be on the soundtrack. That would have been a single, and then and one of my best friends, Dean Carr, directed the video, so we were all excited because we finally kind of had something. We were in like working on kind of together and well i know at the time that uh john taylor was leaving the band so there's a lot of issues at that point well, but i just i'm not going to throw anybody under the bus but it definitely wasn't john taylor <laughs> well, i most likely know who it is but i'm not going to go there either so <laughs> anyway definitely... <laughs> no i don't want to i don't because it's not i don't no it's it's a conversation that's not supposed yeah, to be privy we're not going there no and there's more it's more complicated than just be able to start blowing people over the well place. and i wanted to say this the whole reason i brought this up is how many other things have you worked on where you were technically not credited not a lot to be honest with you not a lot the biggest one i think and i did not get credited but the one that sort of got the only one i really would even mention would be the charlatans record because basically that record came out of me and um, Tim and um, oh, Jesus, Christ, Mark hanging out and just come over to the house. And we started messing around. They were in LA because the band's from, Man uh, from Manchester or up there, up from up north somewhere. I think Manchester. Yeah, they're from Manchester. They gotta be. Yeah. And uh, it was a really organic thing. We were friends. Me and Tim had been friends for a while. I met Mark. We like just, had an instant like man crush. I love that guy. And we just started to come over. Let's work on stuff. And and the next thing we knew, we put our head up. And I think we had like probably seven songs laid out and we were practically done. And nobody even knew we were doing it. The label didn't know the band. I mean, you know, we just did it. And then it got like kind of presented and everybody was like, this is amazing. And, you know, and then essentially they kind of, I sent them everything and they ended up going off and finishing the record and sort of, downplaying my contribution but the only thing is that record you know what the release date of that record was what september 11 oh 2001 yeah. so that's like kind of a you know that's not a good that wasn't a good day to drop a record no <laughs> I mean, it's pretty good i think it's a great record i love that record wonder Woman. but but it's all good again it's not like you know, that's not why I'm doing it. I get, and I, and I would say, I, 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 yeah, that has never really happened on anything that and, really matters. Like on Out of Control, I mean, I co produced that song for sure, but it's all good. I was, you like, and when you're working with people like the Rolling Stones and David Bowie, and you, you serve at the pleasure of the president, you know what I mean? Right. right. Like, so who, who am I to even, I'm, I'm just happy to. I get it. And, and, a little footnote in the books. I, I'm a footnote in the history books. I, you know, I, so I'm going to go in and start bitching about. Oh, I should. I was lucky to be there. Let's be honest. And 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 then within that though, I definitely did my bit, which was what they were looking for. They needed a little fresh injection of, uh, you know, youth at the time, and 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 just you know. And I did my bit because they kept asking me back, you know. Well, and please understand, I wasn't opening a Pandora's no, box for you. Have to apologize for the question. That's it's a fair question. It's like, it's cool. um, cool. so yeah. what was it like to work with Alice Cooper? Well, that was really interesting. <laughs> um, but Alice was awesome. I mean, Alice, the coolest thing about him is, you know, we basically wrote. I mean, again, it's like I can get it all. There's some kind of a weird side to that story, but it boiled down to this. We basically wrote most of those songs on the spot. So every day he'd come and we'd, okay, what are we going to do today? Hey, you know, I'm like, hey, what, you know, how do you feel about maybe like, you know, digging in? It's like Reed Kubrell used to say, it's like playing Cowboys and Indians. You got this rich catalog of amazing tracks that are like, the cornerstones of like a genre of rock and roll. So it's not like I'm going to go and rip off schools out, but you can, you, you've got so much. Um, what's the right word? Uh, there's just so fertile ground there for inspiration. And Alice was cool like that, you know? So, and it was similar to working with Michael because a lot of stuff would come out of his head and it would end up being, Oh no, that's a guitar part. Or that's a, we did this like, 
kind of Brian Mayish play uh, multi track guitar lead thing, and he sang me every part. He sang me the harmony, and he, and it was amazing. We were like finishing each other's sentences, and you know, I mean, he, he's, he's Alice Cooper, you know, and I'm pretty proud of that record. I mean, ultimately, you know, the band. He, I'm like, one point, I'm like, dude, don't you have a band? Because there was sort of a It was a situation where the band sort of wasn't in the equation. And at some point, I'm like, don't you have a band? And come to find out, you know, his touring band, was Chuck Garrett, was like Chuck Garrett and Kelly, Carrie Kelly. Are they fucking amazing? And, and I think the best two or three songs on the record actually came from them, you know? Because it's a lot of pressure to sit there and write a song, like, you know, at least one or two a week. You know, it's just yeah. okay. You know, so... It was cool working with him, man. I mean, it's like, again, it's like you're working with an icon. It's like, like Ozzy? It's funny, because interestingly enough, the other interesting thing about that is when I was working with him, he still wasn't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is sort of relevant, you know, to our little story now, and kind of came to find out why, which was preposterous, as egregious as In Excess not being in, Alice Cooper not being in, in 2007 or whatever it was, and there's a whole genre of music. And I don't, people don't realize. I didn't realize. He was around in the late, he was around in the 60s. I didn't so know that. Like, yeah, go look it up. Zappa signed him in like, it was like 67, I think. It was real early. Wait, I always think of Alice Cooper as the 70s because that's when he had all his real big success. But they were, you know, pounding away in the, in the, in the definitely the late 60s. Wow. And he was doing the famous story Alice told me is, and I've heard it, you know, it's common knowledge if you're an Alice Cooper fan, but they were playing some venue in LA and it was all peace and love. And these guys come out and just are delivery. It, it took them, he said, by the end of the first song, they had cleared out like a thousand people. It was empty. The only three people left were Shep and, and Frank Zappa and, and maybe the, one of the band's girlfriends. And Zap was like, anybody that can clear a room this fucking fast, I got a sign. <laughs> <laughs> I, I once worked with a guy who uh, he was a stock boy bagger at a grocery store in Arizona. And he said that Alice would come in, baseball cap on, golf shoes, come over and say, OK, this is what I need for my groceries. Can you go get it? And pay him and get him. He would go get the groceries for him. He's like, he was so normal. It was weird because I was expecting Alice Cooper to be Alice Cooper. But no, oh, it's wow. very well, yeah. And there's and I mean, I think that's what kind of happened with Alice is that way before I met him, but he lost sight of where the persona ended and he began, and that's what got him. I mean, he almost died. Like he was in really bad shape back in the day. And I think his wife had a lot to do with helping him pull it all together. And so the Alice Cooper I worked with was just, you know, as far as a a, a, a a person with their shit together, was amazing. I mean, he played golf every day once. He was in the 300 club. That's what he called it. He actually got me, he planted the seed for me to start golfing because I had never even thought about playing golf, really. And he would talk about it. That's all he was really interested in was golf and music. And he got to, uh, you know, a really good place in his life, I think, because that guy went through a lot, you know, and... Uh, yeah, he was dead normal. He was just a good, normal, solid guy. But then you start driving, you know, I was in Laurel Canyon, and, and you know, and then you're going up, and he, we got, we went on a couple of drives together, and that's where Zappa lived. That's where we went our first, we auditioned for Zappa, and this is, you know, I had a couple of those. I, I worked with Ray Manzarek's uh, son, and Ray came over one day, and just sitting in a house in Laurel Canyon, hearing stories about Laurel Canyon from people like that is pretty amazing, you know? I'm sure. I'm sure, because, I mean, now, back to... Alice is just, you know, he's, he's awesome and, 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 and more power to him, man. You know, those guys deserve, you know, what's great. I mean, if you look at all of them, the one thing they all have in common, they all got, they all got burned. The stones got ripped off. They all yeah. woke up at one point and broke and owned, owed a, you know, a shitload of money in taxes. So they all came out the other end for the most part. You know, they, they're all, you know, they're all doing well, you know, actually, I don't think Alice ever got burned because he had Shep from day one. Shep always looked out for him. But most of the artists of that generation, like David Bowie and, yeah. and uh, you know. So Alice told me when he got his first royalty check, he wanted to go out and buy like a yellow Ferrari. And Shep said, no, you're buying a house. And he bought a house in Phoenix. Nice. And I don't know if he still lives in that house, but like 
So uh, take Alice out of that. But, but it, the rest of them did, and that's what you know goes in a lot into shaping who they ultimately became. You know? Well, it, it affects who you are. I mean, when you go through the challenging times, that changes who you are. I mean, you you know that everything can be turn from being golden to crap in a very short amount of time. Yeah, it doesn't take long. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. So, um, yeah, well, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you about your Mustang. If that was, I thought you were driving a Mustang oh, in the last rock. That's, that's show business. Kind of figured, but you know, I had to ask. <laughs> <was> show business. <laughs> I had to ask. Um, but I did have a 67 Firebird for a long time. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So are there any artists that you ever, you know, that you wish you could have worked with that you never got the opportunity to work with? Yeah, but not too many that weren't, you know, that hadn't died before I was doing stuff. Like I, I, I had, a, you know, I got to work with a lot of people I never could have even imagined working with. Um, trying to think, who, who? I mean, I, did you ever there were like some bands I was really fan of that I wish I, you know, but. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, like, yeah, you know, they would have had to come back. Like, per, I mean, what about, did you, did you ever have mm. the chance to work with Prince? Or would you ever? No, there you go. That's the one. That's the one. That's okay. the one. The closest I got, well, interestingly enough, so when I was coming up, my, one of my best friends was uh, Tony Gadaris. So he was like a bass player. We were always in bands together. And Tony actually played bass on the... Uh, I think I'm Kelly's hero. It's like, because we were like best friends growing up. And when I started like producing and stuff, if I can, you know, if there was an opportunity for him to play, I'd get him on it. So I, he played on Kelly's heroes. He played on the Black Rage song. He was in a band with David Coleman. And I introduced him to this guy, Mark Aber. I think I introduced him to Mark. Yeah, I would have done it. And Mark was aside, he was in a band called Aggression, but he was Mickey Rooney's stepson. And then David Coleman was Wendy, uh, yeah, Lisa Coleman's brother. And David, you know, he wrote Around the World in a Day and worked with like a genius sort of cello player. He was really into Middle Eastern music. So they had a band together. And so I kind of was in the orbit of Wendy and Lisa a little bit, but I think it was after they had left Prince. But the closest I got to Prince was I had a room in the record plant. Like a, I had the up stairs sort of production suite and that's where me and michael worked actually when, when we were writing and stuff um or one of the places we worked i had it while michael was still here and uh i remember one day prince was coming into the studio so they had the room all wet ready for him and you know it was like so awesome it was so prince they had put all this purple sort of billowing stuff and his guitar one of his guitars was on a stand in the room that was always there was his guitar and then they had fixed the room up and made it all purple. And I don't know what he was coming in to do, but I never got to see him. Oh, and the other time I, I got to see Prince was I did one of my first jobs was I did like um, monitor mixing and backline at the China Club. Okay. And Prince would come into the China Club and, and there was a downstairs sort of VIP room. And they had this really amazing fish tank. And Prince would always be standing in the corner, like full on purple rain era with the, like the round glasses and like. And he would be just standing in the corner. I remember seeing him in the corner, but yeah. That knows yeah, I wasn't quite. But yeah, Prince would have been the one for sure. That's the one guy. I mean, just to even just get to spend a day in the studio with. That would I mean it would have to be an incredible experience. Like I got to spend a day in the studio with Eno, and it was just hanging out in the studio, me and him alone in YouTube studio, and just throwing shit at the wall. You know, like just trying different stuff. On a song, but just being in a room with him, and I get you. I'm saying, I'm telling you, you absorb so much. Just having, you know, everything I I am is really uh, the end result of all the people I've had the opportunity to be around, and always somebody being there, like you know, at the next level, mm -hmm. not just musically, but as like sort of mentors. Yeah, you know. So now I, you know, I've felt this way for a few years. Now I'm sort of. You know, I was always the young hotshot kid. So it's like making that transition to being the more statesman. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's just a different time that I think what people value is different. Like 
to me, that was everything. I mean, I used to kind of get shit for it because like I was really close with Verdine White. It's like, I got to do a record with Verdine. Verdine's going to produce me. Why are you getting Verdine? It's like, because it's fucking Verdine, bro. Like, are you crazy? You know, like the business side people, you know, you need yeah. to do it by yourself. And you got to bring all these people in. And it's like, no. <laughs> well, and speak. And, and that's the thing, people don't necessarily appreciate what has come before. And that, that brings me to the fact that I don't live in Los Angeles, but I've heard that the Viper Room is going to be kind of turned into a museum type thing. They're building condos I around it. so many things with the Viper Room. I heard it was getting closed and I heard it was, I don't know what the hell's going on with the Viper Room, to be honest with you. I suppose I could find out, um, but yeah, I'm not sure. But I mean, that goes back to a different time because the Viper Room was known for, besides River Phoenix, it was known for breaking people in, making these all-star bands that would happen. It, You know, oh, the Neurotic yeah. Outsiders got their start there. So, yeah, it's true. So I'm, it, once, I'm curious now. Concerned with plans to redevelop the iconic Viper Room. All right, this is pretty recent. The redevelopment of the iconic Viper Room in West Hollywood has been subjected to criticism from neighbors concerned with project plans. Located along Sunset Boulevard, the proposed project would include an 11-story hotel. Yeah, I, I heard they're tearing that whole shit down, and there's a lot of that going on in L.A. right now, so I'm not sure. But see, the Viper Room, too, it's not even about the Viper Room so much as the person who owned it and the reason he created it. And... The time we were in and the possibilities of all the things that could happen based on all the people and the vibe of the energy of the world we lived in then, you know, and the people going there, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, Johnny's place and he basically opened it up to have a good, cool place to go hang. Yeah. And, and, and it fulfilled all that. And there was a magic, there was like a magic to that place because of the way it was run by Sal where anything can happen. It wasn't like that every night, but there were moments where all the, you know, like the night at Michael was his last public performance and Billy Gibbons is walking down the street and Sal grabs him and pulls him in and he's pointing. I'm like, come on, man. I hand him the guitar, right? He does a solo, gives it back. Like shit like that. People losing their mind. I mean, can you imagine being in the audience that night? No. You know, and, and, not, and none of it was filmed. None of it was recorded. It was, it was a moment in time, which is, I think, even better. There's just some pics from my buddy Jim, but Jim Steinfeld, but so it can, it can be in the memory banks, you know, where now everything is, you know, which is fine, but everything's documented now. But, no but well, that's what I was going to say. You're losing something because how much are you enjoying if you're sitting there holding a phone? If you're holding a phone, watching everything, are you really enjoying what's going on around you? Yeah, no, it's, 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 different. it's a different time. I mean, it's great to look you back. You couldn't on. have a bike room now because it wouldn't. It wouldn't even. Nobody would want to go to it. That's not what they even. No. Are looking for anymore? There's a whole different energy now and a vibe, and you know, maybe you could, but I, I don't think it would be the same level of. It's just the again. It's just different, you know. It's just different, but that's what makes it great, right? Like it, it, you know, it was a reflection of the time. It was it. Right. I mean, the space itself was cool. I mean, now it's a really kind of historic space. And we start going back that whole area. It was this place called the Central before it was the Viper Room. Um, funny enough, that's Bernard. Cool. So my sound guy had two questions. And okay. one of them is, what is the one thing in a studio that makes a session go well? The one thing? Mm -hmm. Or are there are many. Well, I think the one most, there's one thing that I think has to be there for the hundred other thousand other things, the many other things to happen. And that's the environment that's created, right? Like the, I don't mean the physical environment. I mean, the environment, the feeling in the room. And it was always my, my, uh, like partner, John X was the, the first time I ever really, not the first time I ever went in the studio, but one of the first times I went in the studio was a place called Fiddler's, and it was on Melrose. And John was like the, the house engineer, and I mean, he couldn't have been more than 20 years old. 
and he had like blue hair and one blue sock and one pink sock and you know he was just this but his energy and his vibe he was like the kind of guy that would give you such a hard time but do it in a fun way and i always used to tell him man someday i'm you're going to be my engineer and, da, 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 da. and i ended up we ended up going all over the world together and he you know and John was the one, though, the first one where I ever kind of experienced that, where you walk in a room and there's just like a vibe. And you're not overwhelmed by the fact you're in a recording studio. You know, as a kid, I was probably 18 years old. So that to me is, I think, the most big. And that comes from just like the way you treat people and like just the, the energy in the room and the energy you're projecting. And, and, then, and then the art of, I think this is another thing that's probably getting a little bit lost, but that's why, you know, like, 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 I bet, like, like, I've never, well, I've been in the studio with Rick Rubin. Like, that's, Rick is a great example of that. Like, he doesn't really do a lot of anything technical, but he has an energy and a vibe that, like, he, his mere presence creates, right? And a lot of that's built on, the, and then, it's, you know, obviously, there's a lot of other things that go into it. So he's, like, a good example of that side of being a producer, I think at least from the outside looking in, you know, like. So you've got to create an environment where, and, then, and you hear about this on movies too. It's like where the artist has the freedom to, to fail. The, 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 it's just the freedom to, to go wherever they, they're not feeling self-conscious, um, you know? So that's the one thing I would, I would uh, stress to people. And it just starts with an awareness. Because it's not something you can tell anybody how to do. A lot of it is the charisma. It's just it's just creating that. Like we're doing right now on this podcast. You know, you, but what you're projecting and your attitude and your energy. And there's a know. lot of there's a lot about trust. I mean, whether it's 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 the energy projection, but in order to be really on and connected and be able to be creative, you have to be in a place where you trust. You trust that you have the freedom. You have yeah, but it's chicken and egg. It's like where does the trust come from? The trust comes from. Mm -hmm. that uh, you're not going to trust the motherfucker until you feel comfortable with it you know That's very true and it's not something you can even try and do it's a weird thing to try to describe you the way the best way is to kind of be exposed to it like i said with john and then you recognize it and then you know then you put the assistants and lab coats and we used to do so much crazy fun shit and just go out of your way and set up slot cars michael liked slot cars we used to set slot cars up at scale just whatever it may be you start to create this we're just a bunch of kids that never grew up. I mean, that's the whole point. It's going back to what we first talked about. Staying in touch, you know, with that inner little child that the, theoretically, the, under those circumstances, is living the dream. So why would you be miserable? And that's kind of this like thing with Michael's whole situation is it got so heavy from the outside yeah. that it disrupted all of the fun, good stuff. And if I could do anything, it was just like, okay, well, we're in the room, man. All that shit goes away. That's why there's no pictures of us. There's only one picture of me and him in the studio. Because the last thing we're going to do is start whipping cameras out. You know, it's like he's trying to escape that shit. Right. I mean, when you listen to Save Your Life, I did get a little... It, it did touch me a lot. And I mean, I had heard it before on when I watched it, you know, when I watched the show Last Rockstar four years ago, but hearing it without knowing it, going back to that, when I heard it the other day, there's something very touching because in a way, there's, there's that song and it's like, there's a man that had hope, but then there's a man that had great pain which a lot of times makes an artist that much greater because they are in touch with their emotional side. And there's somebody that you can resonate with because you can experience your own pain through this, that music. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And the, and, the, and the other thing, again, it gets back to that thing of honesty as an artist, right? Like Michael's, most of his songs, they were pretty, it was pretty much like, it's like a comedian who uses their own, it's like therapeutic, you know, he's yeah. using all the shit he's dealing with. It wasn't always negative, but it's just he's channeling it in it and expressing it and coming back out with it. And then that's what the people tap into because they feel it and relate it to their situation, you know. 
And it was like a lot of auto, because it was all coming from a sincere place. He didn't need to go find some shit to write about. No. He may read a book that inspires him or see a movie that inspires him or listen to another record that inspires him. But it's still all coming through that filter of him, you know, and his. Well, and the, the, the last know? the last two, you know, the two lines that stuck out from what he had last wrote in that hotel room was about the monkeys outside and the hook and suck the hook into him. And it's like, at what point that hook can be con- looked at a couple of different ways and only he would know. The hook is, you know, the hook that would yank you out from celebrity that you're done by your 15 yeah, minutes right. are over or the hook of I'm trapped and I, I can't get off the I can't get off. If you use a fishing analogy that my time is near. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, well, go yeah, ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I, was gonna finish your thought. I was just going to say, so you don't. That's the one thing about lyrics is. And I think you meant I was reading something about something you had said that back in the day, Lyrics had so much more meaning. They weren't just something that was straightforward that you you were you weren't opening up them for interpretation. Where now, I mean, like with Michael, there was always something underlying that you could look at. It wasn't it was honest, but there was also sometimes some subtext that you could look into. Well, well, yeah. And what I kind of really meant was it's not even about the lyrics, it's about the way people perceive them. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm not like People says, what does he say? It's like, that's up for you guys to decide and let it mean what it means to you, right? Like what it means to you is all that really matters to you. The important thing is that if it's hitting you in a way that it's moving you or making you feel a certain way or think, you know, inspiring you to think Mm -hmm. and feel, then it's legit. And it doesn't matter if it's Taylor Swift or Michael Hutchins or Bob fucking Dylan. If it's moving somebody, it's all relative. That's again, gets back to that thing. It's like, it's all, that's what I learned. Like how to not, you know, when you start out, you're very opinionated as a kid. And this is what's cool. This is what sucks. And then, you know, and as you grow and you mature and and, and and Sean Ryder helped me see this too. It's like, it's so easy to knock stuff, but if somebody, if it, if it means something to somebody, then it's, 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 it's valid because it's, done what it's supposed to do you know? so it's not for anybody else to judge it's really personal right right it's just the package it's wrapped in. but right. you know i can sit here and look that's so stupid that music's so stupid but no if it's fucking emotionally hitting somebody oh uh, there's a there's a person i know of interpretation let it mean what it's going to mean to you because it may mean something totally different to somebody else and when it's all spelled out again that's removing the gray area it's like no, it's it, we know what it means because we know what toilet paper this person uses and we know the last time they farted and we know everything about the artist now to the point and we know that because there's a video that's specifically showing you with the lyric video of, of what these images you're it doesn't leave any room for the for the listener to use their own sort of creativity because just listening to music is creative. Mm-hmm. You're allowed to kind of wander and go where it takes you. So that that that's kind of what I meant. I'm not saying that's a bad thing or a good thing. Again, people always want to reduce everything to well, like a culprit and a victim, but it's not. It's just is what it is. Both can be true at the same time, you know? One statement that somebody had told me once that really drives me nuts is feelings aren't facts. But you're feeling something when you listen to the music and you may, you know, somebody else may feel something different. So while feelings may not be a tangible fact, you still are emotionally connected and you still feel something. Right. Well, I would say feelings aren't fact. In I mean, feelings are fact in art. Feelings aren't fact in math. Right. <laughs> That's right. the problem. The feelings and the facts are are going into worlds they shouldn't go into, right? And, and right. disciplines they shouldn't be applied to. But in art, in the context of music and and um, paintings and seeing a film and eating a great meal. Feelings are the only facts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's why when the person said, I was just like, yeah, I don't agree with that, but I'm not going to say anything because as an, as an author, you know, I, I have a character in one of my books that somebody said he's the vilest man in the world. And I'm just like, okay, 
at least I made you feel something. It may be that he's vile and he's you hate him, but I still made you feel something. People hated J.R. Ewing, but that show was very popular. Yeah, again, but you know what's interesting about feelings and facts in, in like, say, science? Like with what Terrence Howard's doing right now, there's a, um, I can't remember the guy's name. It's one of these, you know, really high level professor guys. Um, there's a technical side to what he's presenting, but but what I like about what Terrence Howard is doing is he's he's delving into something and he's trying to find another way of looking at stuff, you know? And it's like, and the, the thing this guy said that was brilliant is all the, and it's the same in music. Most great achievements, like just for me personally, usually come out of a mistake or something unintended, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's where music, you know, in the studio, that's part of maybe going back to the question, was it, you say your son asked? No, it was my sound guy, sound guy. Your sound guy, yeah. you know, is, um, Like that openness to ask questions and all the great, like sort of momentous breakthroughs have come out of a mistake or something you want. You didn't go, you know, can't tell many times where it's like, okay, I got a plan for the song. And here's all the things I don't want it to sound like. And it's like, but you got to allow the shit to happen. The difference is being able to recognize those moments and then build on them. Right. And what this, with the um, uh, Weinstein, I think his name is Weinstein. He's really, he's on, you know, a lot of podcasts. I think he's been on Joe Rogan. He said, like, even, you know, there may be 99 things that Terrence Howard says that aren't, like, really true, but all it takes is one being correct, and that could represent a major, right? And it's like this idea of just shutting it down. No, like, debate why it's not valid and legit, but don't throw the baby out with the bad water, so to speak, you know? Right. And so that's where the feelings and the facts things, you know, there's a fine line there, but when it gets it goes too far, when it's like what you see right in front of your eyes is being denied because somebody says, I don't feel that. Like, I feel a certain way. So, but in music and art, and in art, feelings are everything because that's the whole point is to move you and inspire you to make, you know, to, 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 to go after something greater in your life, you know, or to lift you up when you're feeling like shit. I mean, or whatever it may be, it's all emotion, you know? Yeah. I got another artist for you, Freddie Mercury. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I got to work with um, Roger Taylor. But I never got to work with, obviously, Freddie Mercury. But I'll tell you what, the thing that I had, the moment I had just semi-recently is I was listening to Under Pressure, and I got to go in a studio with Bowie. Yeah. One of the things I got to do was go track some vocals with him. And I was imagining those two in the studio oh, wow. just trying to one up each other and go listen to that. Listen to fucking under pressure and just listen to the way they're answering each other. And it's like, oh, yeah, how about this? And like Freddie Mercury, I mean, it's just like so beyond like. But didn't we have comes, he's like the perfect marriage of like super high level technical ability but then as in tune and vibey as anybody you could ever imagine and the same with david it's like they both have this oh it's just so perfect that's such a perfect record so then i have another song for you to at, look at then david but bowie that, and mick jagger dancing in the streets yeah, well that's i think a little different that, that they were just having you can tell they were, they were having, having fun i know it wasn't the one upsman but, but again, i mean it was like and I remember what was that was for Live Aid, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. It was for Live yeah. Aid that just happened so was, to have 39 yeah, years like ago. Cool, yeah. It was 39 yeah. years ago, Saturday. Yeah. But again, that's the thing. Everything is again, it's all relative. It's like, you know, both of those are great collaborations and they both give you something on different levels, you know. And mm -hmm. neither is better or worse. It's just different. You can't really music's not sports. I think that's the other problem where this whole sort of like having a first place and a second place and when that comes into the equation, because again, it's all subjective. But so is that, it, it, rules, it leaves a lot of people out of the equation and it lends itself to certain type of artists thriving in that environment. Right. Mm -hmm. But then are we starting, is that why, since it's not a sporting event, is that why we start with these, these flame wars or whatever you want to call them on social media that they go, the artist goes after another artist. 
Well, yeah, but that's competitiveness. That's, that's well, that's like, what I'm getting at. I mean, healthy, sports is competitive. Again there's, again, there's a healthy, like, sort of, like, like the whole, and is it, you know, and again, I think that's the difference. Like, that used to be manufactured by the press. Mm-hmm. Now, the artists are doing it themselves, but they're doing it for the same reasons. Let's be yeah. honest. For the most yeah. part. Like, those, are you talking about, like, beefs? Yes, yes. Yeah. I was talking about beefs, and I just couldn't think of the word, so that's yeah, where I went yeah. with Flame Wars. But most things, we know why people do that. Mm-hmm. You know? And every now and then there's some genuineness to it, but but there used to be like like you know the the Beatles and the Beach Boys famously were listening to each other's records and it was everybody was making everybody better. So it's all how you use it, you know. Right, right. It's all uh, how you use it, you know. Yeah. Um, Rich had another question on my sound guy and normally I don't do this, but you know, when I told him you were coming on, he was excited. So is there one thing you can't live without in a session, certain piece of equipment, or is it just going back to what you originally said? Yeah, not, not really anymore. I mean, I kind of got everything. I mean, that's been one of the great, I guess for me personally, one of the great positive, um, well, results of like the, the, the technology now is so like the future is so here, you know, and, and people now probably kids and stuff coming up, take it for granted. But like I've always said, I was really lucky because as gear became accessible, I got like a keyboard and all I had was this one Juno 106 and just like wrapping my head around that and a drum machine and a porta studio and building tracks from that. And then all oh, I got my hands on a sample and then my life changed. But I had that one sampler, and it was very limited things, and you had to be very um, sort of um, like, you know, thinking 10 steps ahead because I only had four tracks, and, you know, everything had to be sort of where now it's just you open up a computer and you could go from zero to 10,000, you know, like with all the soft sense and the plugins and the programs, and the, there's a million things to choose from where every time I open up a, you know, if it's a compressor, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a DBX. 160, I actually know what, I actually used a box or 1176 or whatever it may be. I remember I had a real one of those at one point. So I think it's a little different perspective when I go to grab something or now, I mean, I always dreamed of having a Fairlight back in the day. Now I can have 10 Fairlights set up. You know what I'm saying? And like, so, so the access and, and, and then they all sound so good and they're also like legit with the way the, the you know they've been you know with the, the way they've been constructed or whatever we're getting the filters right and like just doing all the stuff to make them really you could almost they do they have the same characteristics and so you know i guess if i couldn't do without anything it'd just be my computer yeah trust, <laughs> trust me i understand that one so is there let, let me say is there anything else I know right now that this is a limited pressing of the single. Mm-hmm. And are you, if it sells out, will there be another pressing or is this just it? And that's it. One and done. That's a good question. So with the one, the, 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 the white version, probably not, you know, we're almost down to the end of them. Now we may do something different. Maybe we'll do a different color or something like that. I haven't kind of figured that out yet. Um, but now with the deco release, though, with the red one, um, I mean, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The, the thing is now, though, you know, we got a lot of it's it's interesting because it's really cool how I think people really value getting something tangible, especially when it relates to music. And that was sort of my thing in this. It's like, OK, I can just give the file away. But this is. It's too special to just be some link you click on, right? Like, it's got to be... In fact, hold on. Yeah, no, can you see that? Yes, yes. No, but... I mean, look at this. Do some shameless promotion. That's I fine. mean... Nice. I mean, it's really amazing. This company called Pirate Press made these for us. And I can pull, like, I have the Marilyn Manson ones. And these are are just as, like, 
I think they're even better than the ones that, and at the time, that's Universal Records. Yeah. Making these things. But it's just so cool. You know, it just really is. It really I, it went beyond any sort of, you know. Um, well, right. the, the other cool yeah, just, thing. Just anything. It's gone beyond my, like, you know, what I was expecting. I mean, it really turned out good. And like this, the image was Chris, but it was originally just a, a side face. So the double image was created to be on this, you know, nice. I think a lot of picture discs and it's not knocking the picture discs, but like, like even this one, I mean, it's, it's so cool. This is probably what inspired it. This is the beautiful people remixes I did back in the day. Nice. But, you know, you can see it's still been, you know, and this is fantastic. It looks amazing. Mm -hmm. But it, it was the picture that got put on a picture disc, you know, that, that is, um, so there's just something in 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 bringing that back, meaning it's more that it's just not some thing in the ether. It's a tangible thing, but it's music. And we got so many requests for CDs that we just, you know, announced we're doing a CD, like a maxi single, just a one way with some cool remixes and, you know, because the people were asking for it. So that's what I'm trying to do is listen to what they want what the fans want and uh you know give the people what they want you know within that so look i'm not ruling anything out right now i, I just i'm not sure yet that's fine you know, i do because the, the red one you know deco's doing the red version so there's going to be plenty there's plenty of those at least and right now you know we've done really really well that everything's exceeded expectations i guess is what you say on every level so the so you know we already feel you know i'm like not to forget like you want to post it it's go to bossonics.com <laughs> And, I, you know, I would get one of those white ones while you still can, though, because we're fast running out of them. And, you know, I think they're going to be valuable. I think they're going to be valuable. You know, the white ones are going to be the ones. You know, so I've been playing with some other colors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something I might go, you know, if there's a really demand to do more, we'll do some more. But I might like see if, what the fans think, maybe like, you know, what color, you know, maybe. I did a pink mock-up and purple. It just it looks cool in every color, you know. So so we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I have, the other thing I feel though, and then I'll I'll shut up. And, no, you're fine. That this image is so iconic. You know, I, I feel like we created an iconic image between Chris's picture. Yeah. So the image is definitely going to live. Yeah. Like this is not the last time people will see this image. You know. I mean, I don't know. It looks and, good. Yeah, I can see it. I mean, you know we can see it. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to live somehow. But, uh, yeah. So I have to take you back that first time, because I know for me, the first time I held my book, when it was published, it was in my hand. What was it like the first time you got to hold something that you created? Whether it be something you mixed or something you... Oh, it's always, like, was cool. I remember the first time I got um, my first... In fact, I think it's sitting... So this right here. Oh, wow. Let me see if I can get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what's interesting about this is this is called. It's 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 not gold or platinum. I've got a gold one. There's a platinum one up there. OK. I can't remember the color they gave it. It's for 60,000. So it's like a, they, they give you one right below gold. Because I think gold is 100,000 in England. Um, but this was the first thing I ever, like, Sean brought me this in the studio when we were working on the second record, and it was so cool, but I remember he had it to me, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool, and then I put it, I was, and put, he's like, man, look at it, like, you want it, yeah, he was yeah. like, uh, I was like, cool, but it was good, but you know what I mean? Yeah. We're in the moment, but yeah, that, it's like, it's, I can't remember that what it was called, uh, silver or something, and then, nice. but I have to be honest with you, and I'll tell you something. This vinyl, to me, this is different because 
like the same way that the first time you see your, or you the first time you hear a song of yours on the radio, mm-hmm. you know, and I had the opportunity to, to play with Black Grape a lot. Like, so I got to headline Reading Festival. So when you're a headliner and there's 60,000 people singing your song that you wrote, stuff like that is like, yeah. you know. Nothing like it. But the, 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 this, this is the first time that I've ever been in a position in this whole endeavor where I'm kind of calling shots. Yeah. I'm not at the mercy of some manager or some AR guy or some committee of, you know, and I'm not saying there's some good people I've worked with and, you know, but most of the great achievements in the mute and, and, you know, any artist will tell you in their career, it's usually one really smart person on their side, a great manager, somebody personal to them. And then most of the great shit that goes down is in spite of the label, not because of them, you know, and to be in a position to now sort of, you know, and I've got some unbelievable, I've got Chris Minister and Barbara uh, surveys helping me. It's just the three of us really doing this. And like, it's it's rewarding in a different sort of way, especially, you know, coming on top of you and really having an opportunity to kind of call the shots for the first time. And look at the results we're getting. You know, and that's why I'm trying, and now I'm trying to listen to the fans, what other people want, and really like, not just be like a standoffish dick about it, you know? Right. And oh, and most importantly, keeping everything, like I said, like up to the to the to the level it needs to be at to enhance Michael's legacy and hopefully give him one. I mean, it's like he's not, you know, that's what this is really about, is just reminding the world of his greatness and and helping to inject a little energy into some of these like the Rock to the Hall of Fame campaign, just helping a little bit. You know, I'm not trying to say because of this, it's going to make the difference, but it just helps to shift the narrative. Well, and, 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 and like get people's minds back focused on Michael the singer, Michael the great front man, Michael the fucking, you know, once in a generation charismatic motherfucker who was brilliant, you know, and, and that's the focus. That, that's the sad thing is when I've mentioned NXS or Michael to younger people, they're like, who? And I'm like, how could you not know that? And that's when you start feeling your age because it's like, how do you not know this? And then you go, dun, 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 Yeah. And then, you know, again, there you go, it's all in Trader Joe's. I mean, I've had that <laughs> thing a thousand times. And then it's like, and then if I have to, I fucking show them the, uh, one video. It's like, oh, shit. There's nobody that doesn't know who they are. They might not be aware right. that they, everybody was in excess, whether, they, you, whether they realize it or not. <laughs> do you do you think they'll actually ever get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Yeah, they'll get in. I think they'll get in. They'll get in. Because there's too much, um, I think, and this is, you know, again, it's it's just the only, the only thing that's more holding it back than anything. Well, there was one reason that's been eliminated. And I think, um, but I think it's also, so, you know, like again, this is just a way more positive sheen to all around this now as opposed. So, you know, even like, you know, again, there's been no negative blowback about this release. And I think it's it would just be nice to see everything settle into a positive ambiance around the band. And I think someone like them would step in because you still need like a Bono or a Simon the Bond or somebody to kind of who's gonna induct them. Well, right. You know, who's gonna well who's gonna induct them and who's gonna say who's gonna lend their name to it? Well, they're a lot more likely to do it if there's positive shit right in the band, which or no negative shit. And there hasn't been any negativity, and it's good. That's what I want. I mean, it would have been real easy for me to just start attacking people and talking a bunch of shit. And 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 and, and unfortunately, we live in a world where Positive stories aren't really like paid attention to and rewarded very often, you know. But I think this is one of those unique cases where people will, once they start wrapping around their head around everything, and it'll it it, it they are they will, you know. It doesn't have to be everything because that, that would I mean think of how ironically fucked up that would be to use tabloid culture to help promote a person who was kind of like you know. Fucked by tabloid culture. <laughs> yeah, it would not be a good thing. No, so my good. mission is just to, like, I only got control over what I'm doing and I'm trying to, you know, just keep everything like, you know, just be honest and straight and try to keep the promises we keep, we make and then just, you know, keep it positive and, and, and get people to, to 
remind people of Michael's greatness and um, in turn, you know, his whole career. The band he was in, you know, there's so much cool shit they did. You know, I think that will take care of itself then, that whole big deal. Well, I mean, Tim can't play now. His hand's screwed. So... It'll be interesting when they what are inducted. Did he fuck up? Was I don't left? know. I don't know which hand. I just know that he fucked up his hand. But uh, well, it's not so much about what they can do now. I mean, it's about no. what they, you know, and it's what about they what they, yeah. And they, at one point, you know, were the band, as you said. Yeah, they were. I mean, they were like, like you know, for sure. And I mean, yeah, and it's funny because that was like, you know, in the conversations I've had with a couple of people really pushing to get that to happen. It's like, it's not about any, like, do they check all the boxes? It's not even a question. It's about the will of, of the powers that be. Right. And the things that need to happen to happen. It's not like, I, I mean, to be fair. The boxes, like in spade. It's like, come on, are you kidding? Did they, did, I think, I, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I think they sold either 50. I can't get it straight. I mean, ACDC, let us not forget ACDC now. Mm -hmm. You know. They sold a lot of records, but them and ACDC are definitely the two greatest yeah. exports from Australia. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's an icon. You know, they're iconic. It's just. Well, I mean, it, the funny thing is when it, it's called the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And then when I look at people that have been recently inducted, no, I'm not knocking anybody. I just don't consider them rock and roll. Dolly Parton is not rock and roll. You know, but I would push back on that a little okay. bit. I agree with you. There's a lot of people in there that are not rock and roll, but sure. the, the style of the music isn't why they're not rock and roll. And you know what? Dolly Parton kind of is rock and roll. <laughs> she is. She is a badass. <laughs> and she is. Yeah, I can give you that. The music is it. You so that to me is the more okay. annoying part of it. Isn't so much the style of music because trust me, nobody's fucking more rock and roll than Public Enemy. I tell you that right now. You know what I mean? And there's people that have made that argument when it comes to them. And I was lucky enough to work with them. You know, there ain't nobody more more rock and roll than NWA. So, you know, and I'm a big lover of that's, you know, the, those, the, you know, that's when I was coming up. That's my my generation. But I totally agree with what you're saying. There's, there's, so it's all how you look at it. And it's definitely moving in a direction where it's going to be less and less about, what wow. the artists stood for and what they meant and just sort of superficial, let's call it achievements, you know? Um, but I mean, the other side of that is they're running out of people. So they're going to have to fucking let them in sooner or later. Otherwise it's just like, you know, I can't believe James didn't do it. It's just, it's, I, I, I've I heard it. There's so a lot. Stupid. I said, David, you know, cause I'm friendly with David and Steven and I sent them both next congrats. I thought they had gotten in. I didn't realize they were nominated. They were just nominated. You know, how can James addiction again? That's just like Alice Cooper. Yeah. The whole, there's a whole. I movie. hear it's, I hear it's very political. No though. fucking Nirvana without James addiction. There's sure. no, you know, there's a whole generation of alternative artists that are all standing on the shoulders of the Peppers, rightly mm -hmm. or not, and Jane's Addiction. Mm -hmm. But then Perry's impact just from doing Lollapalooza alone would have been enough. But so it's good. It's all that's why, like the, the thing, it's not so much about being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's like the, the, the award, it's being recognized and acknowledged. Like who gives a shit about the Rock and Roll fucking Hall of Fame? It's, it's, it's stupid. It's just a, I mean, the event. It's mm -hmm. just an excuse to spend a lot of money and hopefully from and promote a career. But you know, they I don't even think if you get inducted, you know, maybe the like the principals, I think you gotta buy a table and you know, it, you know, it's a money-making operation, but it's the acknowledgement, you know, and taking your place in history at the table. And that's what Michael and the band and his band needs to happen. Michael deserves to take his place at the Pantheon because yes. he's right up there. And I was saying the other day, it's like if Jim and Jimmy and Janice and, you know, are like sitting around the table, Michael's definitely standing right there behind it. You know, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. he's right there in that conversation of all time great front men, you know? So that to me is why it's not because of. No, I mean, there was, I saw him back in 1986 and, Seeing him, there was nothing to just 
there was nobody else like him. The way he moved, the way he was fluid. I mean, there was nothing like him. And if we can remember him for those moments and not for the crap that was put out after near his demise, that's where we have to be. We have to look at what he created and wonder sometimes what he actually might have created more. Oh. Well, there you go. And that's hopefully what this will do. You know, just give, you know, like kind of just a little glimpse into what might have been and remind the people of how great he was and just, yeah. you know, put a little bit, like I said, a little happier ending on a story that just kind of didn't have one. And, you know, just set, set cement and stone mm-hmm. their position, you know? So, well, you know. I, I thank you, Danny, for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Nigel Hardigan, a rock star in the limelight with a flourishing music career, a talented spouse, and a lovely daughter, conceals a dark secret as he spirals into a haze with the power goddess. Nigel experiences extreme highs and lows, revealing an inner beast. As he descends further into the clutches of the goddess, Nigel plunges to rock bottom, consumed by a delusional world where debauchery rules. Struggling for survival, he faces a difficult choice between his affection for the power goddess and his musical mistress, and the life he once cherished. My Days with the Dark Muse, a Better to Burn Out novel, is available at most online booksellers. As always, the podcast, well, it was interesting. My guest, I mean, this is one thing I love about doing this show is that I get people from all walks of life that can talk about almost anything. And Danny definitely had a lot of stories to tell. I think what he's done with Michael's songs, with, with the clips that he has, that he's bringing them to life, that he's giving Michael a little bit more of a voice is impressive and it's something that i know the fans adore and fans love michael had a lot of life michael was a very passionate person and to have his legacy continue on and not from the darkness and the sadness that was there well it means a lot and it's important that his legacy continue you know every year there's a campaign to get in excess into the rock and roll hall of fame and when they do they'll get michael in there as well and i think that it's something that they deserve. At one point, as Danny said, they were the biggest band around. They sold out Wembley. And I mean, I remember in an interview, Michael saying, yeah, our our champagne tab was more than what we made at Wembley. And that's when you're doing it because of the passion, because of the energy. And, you know, you're vulnerable as when you put yourself out there to be a singer, to be anybody in the public eye. But when you're putting yourself front and center to entertain 90,000 people, it takes an extraordinary person because not everybody can do it. Only a few can. And that takes power and persona and passion, drive and love. And that's something that Michael had. But Danny was my guest. And while we talked about Michael, Danny has done a lot. And he knew at a very young age that he wanted to be that musician. And my comment about to my stepdaughter about don't do it if you don't love it. I'm not trying to dissuade anybody because you can love something one minute and hate it the next and then still go back to it. But if you do it and it feels hollow and there's no, no passion in it, then maybe it's not for you. Maybe your passion lies somewhere else and that's okay. Don't allow somebody to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. And hey, if you uh, feel the need to be a bass player or to be a musician and you're not passionate about it right now, you're just doing it to get the girls or the likes or whatever, then tell me to fuck off. That's okay. Because you know what? Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't know you. You know, when I look back and I think back to wanting to be the bass player, well, I'm not a bass player, not in reality, but in my books, my characters, yeah, I have some bass players in there. And that's what matters because I took something that I I wanted to do when I was a teenager and I turned it into a different dream. So follow your passion, follow your creative truth and surround yourself with people that believe in you and trust you. I'm not saying people that say yes all the time to you, but people that really have your best interest at heart and that care about you. And as he said about the studio, You have to create that environment. You have to surround yourself with that energy because once you have that energy, that energy flows and that's what's important. So 
on that note, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. I'd like to thank my guest, Danny Saber, for coming on the show and discussing. Yes, it's a little bit longer than normal, but, you know, it happens. Still, the, the highest one I've talked to, I guess, is four hours. Two hours made it to air, but four hours total. But I want you guys to enjoy and learn things. And I hope I hope this episode touches you guys a lot. Anyway, on that note, I also wanted to share it, say that I have some pictures of meeting in excess back in the day, and I'll put those up on my Instagram page for the podcast. So I thank you guys for tuning in. As I said, I thank Rich Sai from 30 Year Audio Productions for doing the audio and the sound. And I'd like to thank Fast Susie for the intro and outro music and my guest, Danny Saber, of course. So thank you guys. And whenever you listen to it, I hope you enjoy the show, whether it be morning, noon, evening, or night. And I'll catch you next time, guys. Bye. Bye.